All right, guys, welcome to Tax Tuesday. My name is Toby Mathis, and uh, Elliot, you're way out there in Vegas right now, right? Yes, I am, <laughs> in our office on Rainbow. So so I'm at a remote, undisclosed location that's in <laughs> Miami, Florida. But anyway, so you're, you're watching Tax Tuesday. Hopefully, uh, if this is your first time, we're going to answer a whole bunch of tax questions, and uh, we're going to go through what those questions are here in a second. Uh, and it'll be a lot of fun. And Elliot is in the control room. So actually today I'm probably going to be sitting, uh, I'm going to be sitting in uh, the co-chair and waiting for you to read all the questions. So I don't have to do it because I'm not really good at reading screens anyway. Uh, so why don't you take it from here? All right, right, will do. Uh, first of all, a few rules we have here. You can ask your questions live via our Q&A uh, feature in the Zoom. So please, if you have questions specifically uh, that aren't um, just kind of general in nature, please put them through the Q&A. We have a whole staff there to try and answer those. A lot of CPAs, EAs standing by uh, to take care of those. You can email questions. Those are where we get the questions for Tax Tuesday. Email them to taxtuesday at andersonadvisors.com. That's where we draw them from. We try and just take a few that uh, we, we hope will hit the broad context of a lot of people in a system. If you need detailed responses, uh, you need to become a platinum client or a tax client where we can further address the, those, those type of issues. Uh, we try and make it fun, educational. We want to definitely give back that education uh, to all of our clients and, and those out there. So with that, we'll look at what some of the opening questions are here. Number one, if I choose a uh, cost segregation, do I have to apply the cost seg to all properties purchased in the same year, previous years, and future years? Uh, what are the uh, disadvantages, tax aspects, non-tax aspects of doing a cost segregation? Second, I bought a, an apartment to fix it and put it up in Airbnb and to get the advantage of new business tax deductions. But now that we are thinking on renting it to regular tenants, uh, this will be an investment instead of a business, correct? Uh, then what are some of the deductions that we can take advantage of if we rent it to regular tenants instead of Airbnb, such as renovations, expenses, travel expenses, furniture, so on and so forth? We'll hit some of those. Next question, is it beneficial to set up an LLC versus an S Corp? And are you able to pay yourself a reasonable way, salary through an LLC? How should I hold my stock positions? What is the best way to deal with high capital gains consequences? My husband will work as a real estate agent to qualify for the IRS definition of real estate professional and potentially use the passive losses from our rental property to offset my W-2 income on our joint return. The IRS rule says my, my husband has to own at least 5% interest in the real estate company employing him. Does he need to form an S-Corp to, the, the, to sign the contractor with the brokerage firm so that he uh, can get at least, so he owns at least 5% interest. Next, I sold an investment property in October 21 and paid a very he heavy capital gains. Can I get some of that back if I buy another investment property today or now? How many years can we go back without showing a profit? I think we're getting into the hobby loss rule there. We'll kind of explore that. Is it okay to do your own taxes as a business owner if you had a CPA for 20 years? Always a questionable call there. I bought a single family rental in a short time, excuse me, a single family rental in November and still repairing. No income yet. How do I record depreciation and costs for 2022? How to save taxes by flipping and renting houses? I just started my business in August of 2022. I would like to understand what, uh, what from a tax perspective should be on the top of my mind as we prepare the first returns. And lastly, I think here, if an investor purchases a property that is lower in value than the property sold in a 1031 exchange, will the IRS disqualify the exchange entirely? So those are the questions that we're going to get to today. First of all, we look at uh, Toby's website here for Infinity Investing and uh, the uh, YouTube channel. A lot of good stuff there. I don't know if you can see this, Toby, but... Uh, <laughs> I can know. see it, and I think they should go and subscribe. It's free. Yeah. Got to hit that little subscribe at the top there. And, uh, and, and, and for all the metalheads out there, I just did an interview with Joey DeMaio of Man of War, which is about... They've been rocking it out for over 40 years, and I think you should go watch that, too. There you go. <laughs> it has, almost, has nothing to do with tax. But, but it's it was still pretty cool. cool. <laughs> He's a really cool dude, and... Uh, and uh, one of the original heavy metal guys he used to do the uh, Headbangers Ball on MTV when they 
they would always tear their shirts off and act uh, and act like rockers. But uh, he's actually truly legit, an amazing musician. Uh, so anyway, go to the go to the YouTube channel, click on subscribe. It, it's fun. There we go. We got to track how the record sales do now after that that little nudge there for it by you. See how he says, gonna... "Can you write off guitars and Coke? Well, like Coke Zero." Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> Meals and entertainment. Okay. <laughs> Next. Uh, here's our, again, our YouTube channel here. Subscribe on YouTube for the latest updates uh, with our ABA link. Uh, so subscribe there. You get some free replays of a lot of the material we have out there. We got Clint putting a lot of videos out. Toby, a lot of our staff out there. I think uh, we have Coffee with Carl on the YouTube as well there. So a lot of good stuff there. All right. <laughs> First. First question, if I choose to do a cost segregation, do I have to apply a cost seg to all the properties I purchased in the same year, previous years, and future years? We'll just start right there. Uh, you want me to handle that one, Toby? Of course. Okay. <laughs> well, if you do a cost seg, you're not, you're not required to use it on your other properties. That's very specific to one property. They're going to do the study on that one property. And so that's uh, you're not going to have to worry about the others. You certainly could do the others. It may be a, to your benefit, maybe not to on the others and, and maybe use those in future years or something like that. Reminding uh, everyone that costs, uh, the most depreciation is going to go down over time. Um, so at least right now. So you do not, you're not forced to use it on all of them. Um, even though, even if you aggregate, you're not res uh, responsible for doing that. A little bit about those who don't know what a cost seg is. That is where we're used to taking the 27 and a half year uh, straight line depreciation often if it's a if it's a family rental uh, the cost seg breaks that building up into pieces from a tax standpoint to 5 10 15 year and some 27 and a half year property and what that does is just speed up the depreciation it doesn't add any you still have the same dollar amount overall but it lets you uh, uh, front load some depreciation which often can give you some tax benefits and uh, but no you are not required to put it on the other properties yeah, let me just interject real quick to make sure everybody understands what cost segregation is, because it's easier with a visualization. So if you walk into a rental property, if you ever bought a rental property, let's say it's a condo, right? We won't even make it a single family or a building or anything like that. But you walk into it and you look around, you see carpeting that you just put in, maybe put in some new cabinets and some appliances, uh, things like that. So you, you, it's it's those items that you just saw that carpet for example might be five year property uh according to the irs the cabinets might be five year appliances might be five or seven or whatever they're like they all have a useful life and it's not 27 and a half years so when you buy property your accountant instinctively will say well we can't write off the land we can't take a deduction for the land but what we can do is take a deduction for whatever you improved on that land. And that's where cost segregation comes in. Most accountants treat it, if it's residential, they'll, they'll, they'll write it off over 27 and a half years. So imagine you have a property that you bought for 350000 Maybe the land is worth 75000 So you'd take 375 or 350 minus 75. That would get you to 275 using really simplistic math, and it doesn't quite work this way, but you divide that by 27 and a half, you'd get about $10,000 a year. That's a deduction. So if I, I bring in $20,000 a year in rent, I get to write off 10,000 a year. So I'd only pay tax on $10,000 a year of that income. What a cost segregation does is allow us to write things off much faster. So if it's that same property, 350, there's there's land that we can't depreciate. So we get down to 275. That's the improvement value. You might get a $80,000 deduction in the first year. And that's because you take the, the carpet and the, uh, the, the cabinets and any land improvements and, and any appliances and all those, and you write them all off in a single year. And in, in 2022, we could literally write off anything that had a useful life of 20 years or less. We could write it all off in year one like that, 100%. In 2023, it's now 80%. So it went down just a little bit, but it's still really potent. So let's use our example. Let's say that we bought it in 2022. You get an $80,000 deduction. 
So we just went from having taxable income under that example of about 10,000 to having a loss, a passive loss of over $70,000. That's what cost segregation does. It takes all this depreciation that would have been spread out over 27 and a half years and it brings it all to the front. And let's say you can write it off. You don't have to do that. Just like Elliot, you just said, hey, I don't have to do that to each property. The same is true as I don't have to bonus depreciate. I could just write it off faster. Hey, it's five-year property now. The carpet's this much. You know, these items that are removable, the, the shutters and all these things are, are, are X. The appliances are, are, are this much, you know, and we're writing them off over multi, over many years. The land improvements, maybe there was a, a you know, a, a parking lot put in and sidewalks and a fence. I'm writing those off over 15 years and I just spread them out over 15 years. So in, it, it might be that I don't even have to do bonus depreciation, but by treating the items like you're supposed to, because technically that's a, the permissible methodology is to break it into its components. They allow you to use what's called an impermissible method of spreading it out over 27 and a half years if it's residential property, but that's because it works to your disadvantage. The way that you're supposed to do it's the way that works to your advantage, but requires the cost segregation study. That's all. So you have a little bit of elbow grease. I got to have the engineers come out, take a look at it and tell me what each piece is worth. But at the end of the day, it's going to help you out if you have passive income. It's going to either eliminate it or significantly reduce it. And that's what people are, that, that's why you hear about cost segs all the time. If you have, if you're somebody who's a real estate investor, cost segregations and bonus depreciation are your friend. Absolutely. And I, I apologize, Toby, I don't know if you hit this, but even if you do a cost seg, you got that five-year, we'll call band of property, 10, 7, 15, whatever it is. You can actually just do the five-year property. Uh, you don't necessarily, for the, for the bonus, that is, uh, you yeah. don't necessarily have to bonus all the others. So that might be advantageous in your planning as well. Yeah. Maybe you just break out the, the pieces of it and you went from having $10,000 a year deduction. Uh, in, in my example, I used the crude methodology of $275,000 of improvement and you divide that by 27 and a half year. Now, now you're taking a big chunk of that and making it five year. Maybe the deduction when you're all said and done is a, hey, maybe it's $18,000 a year of deduction, whatever it is. And you're like, hey, that's cool. And I'm willing, you know, I'm not going to really have any income no matter what. And I'm okay paying a little bit. Maybe that's all you do. You don't have to do the bonus. All right. Uh, second part to that was what are the advantages, tax aspect, and none uh, for doing the cost segregation? And I would just say that uh, maybe a, a you know a disadvantage would well you have to pay for the study. We're going to recommend you pay for the study. There's some who go out there and do it on their own. I think that's a very much buyer beware. Uh, so you want to have a professional study done. There is outlay of that cost, but a, a lot of good people do it. We work with Cost Seg Authority. They're going to go out there and tell you exactly how much uh, a good estimate of how much. You're going to save so you know what you're going into, whether or not it's cost effective or not for you. So that problem can be solved. Um, yeah. Let me go over a couple of things because there's some questions here. It says, does cost seg need to be done the year the property was bought? Nope. You can go back and you can do it. The bonus depreciation depends on the year you put the property into service. So if I bought a property in 2019 and I do the cost seg this year, even though bonus depreciation in 2023 is 80%, in the year that I bought it in 2019, it was 100%. That's the year we use. Um, somebody said that they are using cost seg authority and they got, they're got they mad about how they valued the land. Uh, it depends on whether you're doing the actual study because usually you're using an appraisal or you're using the assessed value. You can use the ratio of the assessed value to the improvement or you can actually get a uh, an appraisal where they break down the land. But let's just say that you have an assessed value on your land of $500,000, but your land is worth 800, right? And the land uh, value on the assessment is 100,000. So it's 20%. So you, your land value would be 20% of whatever the price is that you, you paid for the property. So if you bought it for 800,000, the land value is 160, 20% of 80. So you're allowed to do that. Or you can go get an appraisal done. And no, you're not stuck with it. You can always use it. What you really care about when you're using somebody like co a cost seg authority is they're breaking out the value of the improvement. So the five-year, seven-year, 15-year property is what they're doing. 
and it could be a ratio. Sometimes it's a percentage of the of, of it. So you, 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 what I would do is I would contact them and say, "Hey, this is how I want to how I want to deal with it." Uh, and then somebody says, "In the example of the loss, do you lose it or do you just keep using it, carry forward?" You carry forward. So yeah, you can absolutely do it. So sorry, there was a bunch of little chat questions. I couldn't read. Absolutely, resist. no, In, absolutely. Any disadvantages that you can think of other than the cost of the study? Um, you always calculate it. So the disadvantage is that if you sell the property in the first few years, you could have ordinary income recognition of the depreciation that you accelerated. So it could be at your disadvantage, depending on your tax situation and whether you get a big tax hit uh, versus if you just, you know, ordinarily depreciated it at 27 and a half years, you would have less recapture in theory. But uh, it's like all things I say, calculate, 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 calculate. Those are your three rules of tax. Calculate, calculate, calculate. Get, get the pencil out and see whether it makes sense. We've done cost sags after a property sold. So if you sell a property in 2022 and you're not happy with the tax situation, have somebody do a workup for you. The cost seg authority does it for free and see whether it will save you money to get a cost seg uh, done even after you sold it because it, it still works, you might find that you have less recapture or that the tax situation, because like, let, let's say that I've had a property for 10 years and I sell it and I have to recapture tax on the carpeting. Carpet's not worth anything, but under ordinary recapture rules, I have to recapture it all at 25%. If I break it out into its components, I have zero recapture on, on on something that's beyond its useful life so then that carpet would be zero recapture it's all treated as gain and i might be at 15 percent. you know it just depends on my situation all right next question i bought an apartment to fix and uh to fix it and put it into airbnb and uh, get the advantage of the new business tax deductions but now we are thinking on renting it to regular tenants long term uh, this would be an investment instead of a business, correct? Uh, what are the what are some deductions that we can get uh, that we can take advantage of if we rent it to regular tenants instead of Airbnb, such as renovations, expenses, uh, travel expenses, furniture, et cetera? So, yeah, you, we're not going to do uh, well tur turning it into a long term rental. You pretty much get some of the the same deductions you would as a long term versus short term. They're the same. You're going to have you know cleaning expenses. You just might have more with a short-term rental than you do a long-term. Uh, you're still going to have depreciation. You're still going to have property taxes, things like that. The furniture, uh, typically we're going to see that in a short-term rental where you're going to go out and buy the furniture. So you would have that in short-term. If you wanted to have a furnished long-term, you certainly could do that there and deduct the furniture. So a lot of them are going to be the same expenses, uh, even the travel expenses. If you had to go down there and and uh, you know meet with people who are going to assist you with this or something like that. Um, so I don't see a whole lot of differences in the deductions in that in that regard. The operational uh, deductions, I'd say, you just might have more in some category, uh, be it short term or long term, depending on which it is. Um, I don't know of any other uh, special deductions for one or the other. Do you, Toby? No. Here's the thing: if you have an Airbnb, it's treated as a, if it's seven days or less average rental, it's treated as a trader business. So the deductions become not in theory they become non-passive, right? unless you don't materially participate on your Airbnb, in which case it's business loss that's passive, no different than rents. So in a weird way, they could be identical. In a, you know, in this situation, you're looking at it saying, hey, I wanted to get a uh, an Airbnb so that we could get ordinary loss. If we materially participate on it, then I could accelerate some depreciation. I could use that, you know, in my previous example it was a $70,000 loss, right? That could be used against your W two if 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 it's if it's not passive activity. In Airbnb, generally speaking, is not passive activity so long as you materially participate in it. It's, it's it's I always say it's it's a pizza business, you know. So if if Elliot and I started a pizza shop, and Elliot flipped pizzas, you know, and did the pizza stuff, and I did nothing, I was outside the business. When it pays out its 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 income. Elliot's is active income, active ordinary income, subject to self-employment tax or FICA or Social Security, whatever you want to call it. Me, though, I didn't I didn't participate. So it's passive. I could even use you know rental losses to offset that income. 
That's how cool it is. Well, so Airbnb is a pizza shop. Did you materially participate? If the answer is no, then it's trader business, income or loss, but it's still passive because I didn't materially participate. But if I did materially participate, then if I have a business loss, it's ordinary loss. I don't have to follow the passive activity loss rules and I could offset my W-2 income without having to become a real estate professional or an active participant. So there's some huge benefits on the losses. But as for the expenses themselves, not markedly different, really. Um, renovations, you can you can fix up repairs. You have a safe harbor of $2,500 per, per area that if like if I'm fixing something in the house, I could treat it as a deductible repair. Otherwise, if it's a renovation, it might be added to your basis and depreciated over 27 and a half years again, right? You see that we're coming back to a reoccurring theme. It's things are written off over their useful life unless you cost SAG and bonus or if it's a repair. So, so it says renovations, your travel expenses, furniture, those types of things are going to be deductible regardless, um, whether it's Airbnb or just a regular old rental. It's not going to matter. Your management fee is deductible. Your, 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 any cost of the debt is going to be deductible. Your uh, property taxes are going to be deductible. There's lots of stuff. Um, somebody says, what does materially, materially participating in an Airbnb means? There's seven tests for material participation, three of them that are relevant. The first test is, I do, this is, if you're filing a joint return, it's a husband and wife or spouses that would could meet this test together, I guess. But otherwise, if it's single, it's, you have to meet this test. You provide substantially all the activities and nobody else provides substantial services. So you don't have somebody managing the property for you. Um, so if you do everything, regardless of how much time you spend, you automatically qualify. Test number two is, which these are all or, you can meet one of these and you automatically qualify. Uh, test number two is, I spend with your spouse more than 100 hours a year on these activities or on your Airbnb activity, which you could group Airbnbs, but let's just say that on an Airbnb, I spend 100 hours um, and nobody else spends more than 100 hours. I have other people working on the property. I have a property manager, but I spend more time than anybody else. And I spend more than 100 hours than I would qualify. Or you and your spouse spend 500 hours uh, and it doesn't matter what anybody else does. And if, if, if we combine spend 500 hours on managing that activity and materially participating, then we're good to go. But you have those different rules. That's what it is. And just uh, one more that we have from Maggie about whether or not she can still material participate if she pays herself out every month from the Airbnb. Yeah, you can do that. That's fine. That doesn't have any impact on the material participation. Yep. All right. Moving on to our next. Is it beneficial to set up an LLC versus an S corporation? And are you able to pay yourself a reasonable salary with an LLC? So this gets back to that old... Every time we hear, see LLC, we got to know, well, how is it taxed? Because it can be taxed a lot of different ways. It can be disregarded, which just means it doesn't yeah. have a tax return. Could be an S corp, could be a C corp. I was, corp. Being, I was being cheeky there, Elliot. I'm putting exactly. my hands over my eyes. There's no <laughs> such thing as an LLC to the IRS. Exactly. They're ask you what it is for tax purposes. Yeah, we got to pick that tax uh, tax treatment of it. So, mm -hmm. and there are rules behind that. If you don't choose a tax uh, status for it, the IRS will choose for you. The, the basics, if it's just one member, one owner, then it's going to be disregarded. It means no tax return. It just goes on your 1040. Uh, if it's more than one, then it's going to be a partnership where you need a return. But it certainly can be taxed as an S corp. And so if we're asking... What's the difference between an LC tax as an S corp and a regular S corp? Really, nothing. Arguably, just the uh, uh, on many books of states, they'll say that it takes less effort, if you will, to run an LLC. But most of those things that they would require a corporation, you're going to want in your LLC anyway. More meetings, you're going to want to document your meetings. You want to have meetings to show that you're running as a real business. So, really, no difference in that regards. Unless we want to talk disregard versus S corp election. Any thoughts on that, Toby? Yeah, no, I, so when it says, is it beneficial to set up an LLC versus an S-corp? It, again, it, like Elliot said, it depends on on how the LLC is taxed. 
it's it's bad for you if it's a setting up an LLC that's disregarded and treated as a sole proprietorship. It's almost identical if you set up an LLC and treat it as an S corp for tax purposes. The only thing you lose by setting up an LLC instead of an S corp proper is you can't take 1244 stock loss as ordinary loss when it's an LLC versus if it was set up as an ordinary S corp. Um, can you pay yourself a reasonable salary from an LLC? It depends on how it's taxed. If it's an S corp or a C corp for tax purposes, it can pay you a salary. If it's disregarded and it's a sole proprietorship, then no, it cannot pay you a salary. If you are a partner in a partnership, it cannot pay you a salary. So I hope you're kind of seeing that the LLC is not what matters. It's how it's taxed that actually matters. All right. How should I hold my stock positions? What is the best way to deal with high capital gain consequences? And we often talk about setting up a, a trading partnership. That might be one option. If you set up a partnership between yourself as an individual and a C corporation, then put the, the trading account into that partnership. Uh, you'll be able to automatically deflect some of your earnings off your 1040 into the C corp because it's a partial owner of that partnership. And the C corporation offers a lot in the way of uh, reimbursements and deductions so you get that money back to you tax free. So in other words, whatever percentage of, if you have 90% is owned by you personally, 10% by the C Corp and maybe make a hundred dollars. Well, $10 is automatically going to be earned by the C Corp. $10 that would have otherwise gone onto your 1040 to be taxed. But once it's in the C Corp, we have a lot of uh, reimbursements and deductions to get that $10 back to you tax free, where they're a deduction at the same time to the C Corp. So it breaks even, you get tax free money. And uh, that's that's one way if we you know, if holding your positions in that trading partnership. Anything on that, Toad? Yeah, I would say that if they're talking about what vehicle to hold it in, then there's nothing better than a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k because you don't pay any tax ever if you meet the requirements of you know however long you hold it and how old you are. Um, so you can do that. Here we go. Um, if you are trying to get deductions against your capital gains, or if you have other capital losses, like, hey, I have uh, all this capital gain that I'm generating now, but you have a loss carry forward from the last recession, and you want to use that up, then you'd want to hold that individually or something that flows through to your individual return like a partnership. If you have lots of deductions that you need, like you have expenses, you're going to conferences, you're an active trader then what Elliot just said is gold, which is you would hold it in a partnership with a corporation as a partner in it so that it could write off your expenses because you're not going to be able to. Since the Tax Cut and Jobs Act came out, they got rid of miscellaneous itemized deductions. You can't write off if you pay a manager, if you if you pay a management fee, you can't write that off on a stock portfolio. Um, if you're a super active trader, if you are doing more than 750 trades a year, more than 70% of the trade days you trade and you're, and you're investing a substantial amount of your net worth, then you might qualify as a trader, in which case then you could be an LLC or you could just own it individually. There's no asset protection if you do, but you're able to write off your business expenses at least. You can't write off the losses, their capital losses, so you'd need other capital gain. But if you're a trader, you could do something called a mark-to-market election, and then you get ordinary business loss on it. But again, that's not a reason to do mark-to-market election. There's lots of people getting killed with mark-to-market election at the end of the year when they have all these uh, positions treated as they're closed out and they have a taxable event, even though they never got rid of the underlying security. Uh, you only have to do that once before you realize it's not a good idea. All right. And just a uh, reminder of our tax and asset protection workshop coming up on February 11th. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you can watch Clint. And, uh, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm sitting in the uh, passenger seat on that. He does a really good job in the morning going over land trusts, LLCs, corporations. In the afternoon, I go over taxation and legacy planning. Uh, it's absolutely free. Uh, join it and spend a day with us. Uh, you won't be disappointed. I've never had anybody say that was a waste of my time. They usually say, dang it, I did not know. So uh, by all means, pop on and and and, and give, us a, give us a whirl. 
Uh, we do them live. We don't record them. So you're not going to get to see a recording later. Uh, and the reason we do that is because we want to actually have you interact. Like right now we have Dutch, Patty, Troy. There's a whole bunch of folks answering questions in the back office. I'm, I'm probably missing people. Dana's probably on there too. Jared's on there. I know there's a bunch of people. Uh, Matthew, there's Tanya, there's, uh, gosh, yeah, there are a bunch of people and Andrew's on there and, and uh, as well as you and I, and they're answering questions in the Q and A. What we want is that interaction. We want you to not only be learning, but to ask questions. And so we do that live. Uh, but if you come spend some time with us, there's usually a really special offer. We try to make it worth your while, uh, but you're going to learn a lot about the way entity structures work and we're going to give you a path forward. All right. Next question. My husband will work as a real estate agent to qualify for the IRS definition of real estate professional and potentially use the passive losses from our rental property to offset my W-2 income on our joint tax return. The IRS rules say that my husband has to own at least 5% interest in the real estate a company employing him. Does he need to form an S-corp to sign the co uh, as a contractor with a brokerage uh, firm so that he owns at least 5% interest? Thanks. So yes, that's exactly right. You're, you're going to want to have his uh, earnings, if you will, from there being paid through an S corporation that he owns, theoretically 100%, hopefully. Uh, and that way you can take advantage of at least some of the uh, uh, his hours towards the 750 hours. Now, um, and then also there's going to be tax benefits being in the S corporation, but I know you're, you're going towards the real estate professional in your question here. Uh, but yes, that would be the first step setting up that that S corporation. And I know we have, we talk a lot about this, Toby, on the, you know, amongst our um, advisors and things like that, the, what's requ the requirements. We want to have a, you know, maybe an employee contract on that S corporation. We want to be able to make sure that the, the broker knows to send it to the S corporation and, you know, items like that to, to check off. Any thoughts yeah, on that? there's a, yeah, there's the, I always forget the name of the case. It starts with an F that they use as the basis yeah yeah if, if you want to have the s corp receive the money but i don't even think you have to, like the, the calling of this question i don't think you really have to worry it sounds like they're a real estate agent which means they're 1099 anyway you don't have to worry about the five percent it's, it's if you own a brokerage or not own a brokerage but you work for a brokerage let's say that you you were an employee of a real estate brokerage firm you can't use that time towards real estate professional status if you're just an employee if you're an employee with at least five percent interest then you can so if you're the receptionist at a real estate office you're not going to qualify as a real estate professional because you're not doing that activity you're not doing the buying and selling and there's all sorts of stuff management company construction companies development companies if you just work for a development company it doesn't make you a real estate professional they can't they want to see what time you're spending. If you own a piece of the company, then they're just going to assume that you're involved. Otherwise, I got to do 750 hours and it has to be more than half my time. If you're filing a joint return, either spouse can qualify. So in this case, my husband will work as a real estate agent to qualify. That means the husband just has to spend more than half of his professional service time. So his work time being a real estate agent in at least 750 hours. If he does that, prong number one of real estate professional status is met. And all this means is that your passive losses become ordinary. Prong number two though, is you have to materially participate. So you get that, you gotta have material participation on your real estate. So then we get prong number two is, do you meet one of those tests? And I laid them out a little bit earlier, three of them on your rental real estate and it's each property unless you choose to treat all your properties as one and if you're looking for guidance on this it's 26 usc 469 c7 that's where you go look for the passive activity loss rules and there's a revenue ruling a revenue procedure we call them a rev proc on on this precise issue that says aha you actually have to participate on your uh, on your rentals. You do that. So let's just say husband sounds like he's going to qualify. You don't have to be an S corp. You don't have to do anything special just by the virtue of that. He's a real estate agent. 
and they're paying him 1099, he is the business. So we don't have to worry about anything else. Um, that's prong number one. Prong number two is what about your rental properties? Are you guys managing them? Do you have somebody else managing them? Are you spending time on those? As a couple, do you qualify for material participation? If the answer is yes, then you can offset all of your income with real estate losses from those uh, activities. And it gets even better. All of your rental activities are treated as one activity. So you could go do a syndication. Let's say you have a couple single family residences that you 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 pass the material participation test because you're you're managing them all yourself and you're you're meeting all the time requirements and you do a syndication and the syndicator there's nobody spending more than 100 hours on those properties managing them in a year so you pass the material participation test you add up all those activities together and you get this big fat loss from the syndication you get to use that to offset your real estate agent income and your any other w2 income so we could wipe out your income completely under that circumstance and uh, you'd be walking away you know whistling dixie pretty happy right you're not going to have much of a tax liability at all if you meet those requirements so lots of opportunity on this one that's why it's never a bad idea to have a spouse who's a real estate professional I don't care whether they're the one, they don't even have to work on your property. Like they could be in construction. And as long as they're in construction, they meet that test. And then you could be the one doing, you're the one handling all of your other properties and you meet the material participation rule. Like let's say you're self-managing five properties. That's great. You don't ever have to lift, lift a hammer on those properties. As long as you meet material participation, and you're married to a real estate professional, somebody in development, redevelopment, leasing, management, whatever, real estate agent, brokering, as long as you're married to somebody, you're going to meet that test and you could wipe out your income. You know, So if spouse number one's a surgeon making $700,000 a year and they're married to somebody who qualifies as a real estate professional and you manage your own properties, you could unlock massive amounts of losses to offset a substantial chunk you know, there are some limitations on how much loss you can take. It's around $500,000 a year. But let's say you're making 700000 Now, all of a sudden, it's down to 200000 Plus, you get your standard deduction. Plus, if you contributed to any retirement plans. Like, you could get that thing down to a really low percentage, if nothing else, because you decided to marry somebody who's a real estate professional. So, don't real estate professionals look more attractive now? <laughs> The dating sites are going crazy. All right. Next, I sold an investment property in October 2021 and paid a very heavy capital gains tax. Can I get some of that back if I buy another investment property now? No. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we kind of missed the boat on that. We can't carry back on any of these items at this point in the code. Uh, you know, maybe that'll change in the future, but right now we don't have the ability to go back and change anything. But Anything, you know, going forward, if you do have another investment property, perhaps you can take advantage of some of the things we talked about today to, to get some write-offs or some passive loss write-off if you're not real estate professional. So lobby your congressman because they, you know, what they did in the last recession was they allowed carrybacks for three years. They did it under the CARES Act and allowed carrybacks for three years. They did it with Obama when Obamacare passed for three years. That was how Trump eliminated taxes that he paid. You know, they always talk about the $90 million loss that he carried back. That's what they did. They said, oh, you can carry back. So there's always the chance they change some laws and allow a carry back. But otherwise, no, you're probably going to get hit with the capital gains tax unless you had capital loss that you didn't properly account for. Um, you could have done some things to offset it. Unfortunately, uh, you would have had to have done those things within six or 180 days of the sale or the uh, sale being assessed so that January 1st, you would have had until about June 30th of 2022 to, to get a, uh, an opportunity fund. And then you would have had to invest that before the end of the year. So like, I think the, the boats sailed, but use it as a learning experience. All right. How many years can you go without showing a profit? And I, I, I think probably where you're, you're asking this is coming from the hobby loss rules. That's what we often talk about. If you uh, have too much of a loss, the IRS could come in and say, hey, is this really a for-profit business venture that you have going on here? And 
really what the Hobby Loss Rule says is, is that if you're profitable through the last five years, then there's a presumption that you are having a profit motive. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't re, uh, rebut that you know, or rebut it if you have shown that I've had clients who've had losses for several years. IRS asked them about it. You know, hey, are you, you know, is this really a business? And they just show that you know, all the records and how they're keeping their for their business and things like that. Uh, and the, you know, just say, hey, it's it's tough getting started on business. And the IRS is they don't like to enforce this one. They're looking for the people who abuse. You know, I got I bought a, a new camera and I want to show that it's a business, even though I'm using it for all my personal use. That's the kind of thing that they're going after. Um, any thoughts, Toby? Yeah, so the provision is section 183. I think it's just 26 USC 183. And what's interesting is it says in the case of an individual partnership, and I think S Corp, that that if you make money three out of uh, five years, and then there's another standard for horses for, for breeding. Uh, but if you make money three out of five years, you're presumed to be in the in in the business for a profit. Um so let's look at the one that they didn't name, which was the C Corp. So C Corp doesn't isn't affected by this rule. So you can lose money every year and you don't have to worry about it. If you're a partnership, a sole proprietor, or an S Corp, however, it's a rebuttable presumption, as Elliot said. And there's a great case. I think the guy lost money for 18 years. It was the guy that that wrote Midnight Train to Georgia. Does anybody remember that guy that, who, who wrote Midnight Train to Georgia? I'm going to ask the chat people. There's always somebody who's a music buff out there, but I believe it was him. And what he did is he had his son go into the music business and lose money. I think it was 18 years in a row. And he got audited and the IRS said that's a hobby, but he showed that he operated in a business-like manner, that he relied on the judgment of professionals and that he expected to make a profit. And he was able to overcome the presumption Somebody said Jim Weatherly. It was Gladys Knight and the Pips, written by Jim Weatherly. I said, is it Jim Weatherly? Oh, I might be screwing up. I, I thought it was some. It might be. I'd have to go look it up. Does, does anybody remember that case? Okay, Robinson. I just love him. Jim Weatherly. Say, it is Jim Weatherly. Okay. Maybe that's who it was. I might just be completely butchering the case. But uh, now I'm going to look it up and find out. When you start talking again, if you see me on my phone, it's because I... I have to go find that case now, but it was like 18. I think it was like 18 years that he lost money and they let him, uh, they let him have his deductions. They said, you still had a profit motive, uh, but he was, he, he was just bad at business. And some people are just bad at business. It doesn't mean you get, you don't get your deduction. And, and what it really comes down to also, when you hear about the hobby loss rule, it's not that you lose the deduction. It's just that you can't take a loss. So if you lose money, they'll say, Hey, you can only write off up to your income. So if you have no income and you just have expenses, we're not going to let you keep writing that off. But if you had $100,000 of income and $150,000 of expenses that, you know, it's not like they, you're just going to be at zero. They're not going to let you have the $50,000 loss. So and now I have to go look it up. So you go to another one. Now I'm going to research. I never get to do this because, uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go on to the okay. next one. Why Toby gets the right answer for us? Is it okay for you? Uh, excuse me. Is it okay to do your own taxes as a business owner if you've had a CPA for the last twenty years? Uh, it's certainly okay. You could have done that all the last twenty years. Is you know done your own returns. We we wouldn't recommend it. Uh, you know there are changes. Uh, let's say we had this question back in twenty eighteen. Well, we just had a massive overhaul of our tax code. You're going to want a CPA somebody who does taxes, EA, tax attorney, whoever it is, uh, to, to, to walk you through some of those things. If anything changed in your personal world, even if the code didn't, there's a lot of things out there. So I, I wouldn't recommend it. I don't think most, of course, we're biased as tax people, but um, I don't think the wise money would be on doing it yourself, but you certainly are unable to, are able to. Nobody's going to fault you for that. I have heard talk, I don't know if it's true or not. It might be an old, old wise tale that, if they see returns prepared by a CPA firm, there's less chance of audit. I don't know if that holds any water or not, but uh, you know, probably wouldn't hurt. Um, but again, directly to your question, you're certainly welcome to do your own returns. We just probably wouldn't recommend it with all the complexity of the code. Wow, I'm looking at this. I got to read this one now. This is killing me. It was he, he lost. 
there was a taxpayer that that lost money for 42 years and they still, they still prevailed <laughs> uh this, they were primarily motive for profit it was uh Criley versus commissioner that's not the case i was looking for but that's still it's either Criley or Criley, but that's still crazy 42 um, anyway so that was just case in point all right i'm gonna go find the other one and then we'll have to talk about it next time elliot Okay. Uh, but if you had a CPA for 40 years and your in your taxes are essentially the same year after year, I don't I don't know if I would cry if you did your own. Just know you got to sign them. And, and, and you, when you have a CPA, you're really using a CPA because you want to be able to say, hey, he said I could, you know, to try to avoid some of the penalties. And, you know, and, it, and it's not what you pay for your return. It's the value that you receive. So hopefully your CPA is doing more than just filing it. Hopefully they're having a conversation with you. And trying to lower that bill a little bit so that they're paying for themselves. Um, but anyway, I, I think you answered it right. All right. All right. Bought a single family rental in November, still repairing it. No uh, rent income yet. How to record depreciation costs for 2022. So we don't have to worry about depreciation and, and uh, any operational costs until you put it in, or at least it's, you put it in a service, or at least it's available for a service, available for rent, as we say. Uh, if we didn't have it available for rent in 2022, there isn't any deduction to take in those, as far as operational or depreciation or anything like that, maybe property taxes, uh, something like that, that you did incur, that's not really operational interest expense, perhaps. But the rest of the expenses would typically, if it hasn't been put into service, any repairs and all that, that's all going to basis, in which case it will be depreciated that year that you finally do get it operational or play, uh, available for rent. Yeah, so uh, here's the thing is, if you have a property, and, and Elliot, I'm going to ask you this question, because this, if this is somebody, they, they just bought it, and it never got went into service, then it wasn't available, you don't depreciate it yet. Correct. You do not. If, if, if somebody bought it and you made it available and then you did a rehab on it after it was available, you just can't create a loss from the vacancy. Yep. Right. That's so right. so if you if, if we were talking to this person and they're doing the single family and they're thinking, oh, I'm going to buy it and just gut it. This is where you look and you say, maybe it's worthwhile starting to, you know, renting it out for a month even airbnb being it for a little bit, get it into service so that you're starting that depreciation going on. And it really depends on whether you have other rental income. If you don't have any other rental income, then it's probably not going to matter so much. But there is a reason why you do it uh, and start getting it in, kicked off and, and get it into service so you can at least start that clock running. Yeah, just make sure that the repairs, you know, there's not a big hole in the floor or something like that. Someone falls through and you got, you know, asset protection issues. But yeah, as long as the repairs are minor, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Yeah, you get that into get that into gear and then and then get that depreciation in 2022. Now we couldn't do that now, but uh looking back, anybody going forward gets a property, they can certainly take that tactic. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of good questions in chat. There's some that are kind of bizarre that I'm not gonna really read, but uh, but I do like them, especially like there's an IRA one and it's like they're talking about re receiving gold. And here's a here, here's a hint. IRA rules are different than 401k when it comes to physical possession of gold. Do not take physical possession of gold in an IRA, but you can take physical possession of gold in a 401k. The rules are very, very different. One's treated as a uh, distribution and subject to penalties and and tax if you take the if you take the gold coins um otherwise make sure it's a 401k uh because you don't have that same rule if it's bullion things like that um hey there's a youtube channel again yes <laughs> all right kick, recommend kick that you uh you subscribe to the youtube channel and uh, you can see the fantastic, I'm sorry, who, who was the guitarist? Was it the guitarist? for Joey DeMaio is on there, he, but yeah, he was, I posted that already. If you guys like metal and you like uh, Man of War and you like Metallica and, and, and hard rock, and uh, Joey used to actually tour with Black Sabbath. Like, it, was, it, was like, it goes back into the 80s. This is, I think their band started in the 70s, technically, but old time rocker. He's, he's over on a world tour right now. And uh, I think they're going through Germany and Norway right now. 
they're fun. I just, I just, I just have a, 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 he's a kick in the pants. He's just a really great, great musician, great guy. But anyway, there's a whole bunch of podcasts in there. A lot of them are actually related to taxes, but, but I had to fanboy a little bit on, on Joey. So anyway. All right. Only the metalheads know who that is. Uh, how to save on taxes by flipping and renting houses. Well, <laughs> the uh, one thing I would recommend is if we could all, well, there's a lot of different things going on here, but if we can uh, put a C corporation into the mix, that is if you're flipping, you could flip directly through a, a C corporation or at least an LLC disregarded to the C corp. You get some good deductions and reimbursements that, you know, again, you can't normally do if you didn't have that C corporation. So that might be good or even an S corporation uh, for the flipping aspect. If you have renting, you could still use a, a C or an S corporation. We're going to recommend a C probably as a management company. So you could do all your activities that you're overseeing of your rentals do through a C corporation. It earns a management fee that shifts rental income off your personal return, puts it in that C corp. Or again, we use things like an accountable plan, maybe a medical reimbursement plan, uh, corporate meetings under 288, get some of that money back to you tax-free and save some money there. Yes. Uh, if, if you're renting houses by flipping and renting houses, I don't I don't know what that really means, actually. It, I guess flipping is a dealer activity. It's a trader business, does not qualify for 1031 or installment sales under section 453. Like flipping is its own little beast. Renting houses can also be its own little beast. Saving taxes on renting houses is because you can depreciate them. And depreciation has nothing to do with cash flow. So you can end up with losses, even though you have money coming in. Um, and I'll put it this way. Let's say that let's say that you were talking to Congress and you got up there and you said, hey, what should I invest in? And you say, I got the equities markets. I got this wonderful stock market I could invest in. And Congress would say, yeah, that's pretty good. We're going to give you long-term capital gain treatment when you sell it. And we're going to give you long-term capital gain treatment on the dividends that get paid out by those companies. We're really going to, we're really going to take care of you. And, uh, and then you say, well, what about the investment? Can I write it off? When I invest in, uh, in Coca-Cola, can I write it off? Um, and the Congress says, no, we're not going to go that far. Now you go to real estate and they say, oh, we're going to let you uh, to get uh, uh, long-term capital gain treatment. Well, you could even avoid gain entirely by we're going to make this thing called 1031. So you can buy more real estate, you can sell it and you can buy more real estate and you don't even have to pay taxes. You can defer the taxes. And then when you die, we're going to let it step up. You have, your heirs don't have to pay any taxes. So then, and you can do installment sales if you sell it and you want to recognize the income over 30 years, you could do that too. We're going to give you a whole bunch of, of goodies. And then you say, but Congress, will you do something for me when I buy it? How do I write it off? And, and they go, you know what? Unlike the stock market, we're going to give you a deduction when you buy it. We're going to let you start writing off the improvement value. And you could just start taking that as a, as a big old deduction. In fact, you can accelerate that we're going to let you write off anything that's five, seven, 15 year property right away. You know, in 2023, it's 80%. Last year was 100%. But they're going to let you do this bonus depreciation. They're going to let you take a big deduction. And you say, but what if I finance that property? What if I, what if I only put $100,000 down? Are you telling me I could get like a $300,000 deduction on a million dollar house? Yeah, sure. For you. Yeah, we'll let you do that. Really? Yes. Congress is telling you what to do. Congress is saying, hey, we're going to treat different types of investments completely different. What if I flip houses? What do I get for that? We're going to beat you with a stick. We're going to make you pay ordinary tax and self-employment tax. But what if, I, what, if, what if I sell it on a contract? You can't do that. We're going to make you pay tax, even though you don't get the money to for 30, you know, over a period, you're going to get it over 30 years. We're going to make you pay tax on it as though you got paid everything on day one. Congress hates flipping. Congress is telling you to buy rental properties. That's what the tax code does. That's what Congress. Yeah, that's a big point on the flipping. We run into that every now and then. A client tries to sell it on an installment sale. And they don't know anything about the tax code. Well, if you sold it for a hundred thousand dollar gain, you're going to have to recognize all that gain in year one. And yet, you, like Toby said, you're not getting paid for thirty years on an installment. That 
you know, that doesn't work well for with flipping. So you got to be really careful out there. Here's a fun one. So I just had a comment in chat. So Janice said, hey, Toby, you said uh, an IRA can't have, I can't take physical possession of gold. You can't. They said, but I got physical gold that will be kept in an IRS approved Brinks vault. Okay. You can't have possession of the vault, right? Janice, it's going to be someplace else. There's actually a really bad case that occurred where people thought they were buying physical possession of gold and that the, 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 that this institution said that we have possession of your gold. And then, of course, there was no gold. The SEC came in and found out that it was all a scheme and they were selling people gold that didn't actually exist. That's why I like to have, I can actually physically possess it and put it in a in my safe in my home. So anyway, so not to not to do a correction there, Janice, but there is a distinction between you being able to take physical possession and uh, versus having a, a approved third party. And I believe the IRS wants it to be held in like a bank vault, uh, but um, I'd have to go look at that. But there is a di difference. I just love it when when people are actually digging into these things. And it's fun to have that conversation. So I, I know it's not talking about flipping and renting houses, Elliot, but no, that's a good. One. I'm like a cat. I get distracted easy. <laughs> All right. I uh, just started my business in August of 2022. Would like to understand from what, what, what from a tax perspective should be on top of my mind as we prepare to do the first return. Well, Hopefully we had a really good record keeping of all the expenditures that you had. We're going to want that because we're going to need to break them up. What are expenses? What are maybe, um, well, it depends on your business, I guess, what it is. But, uh, you know, you're going to want to categorize those and have an idea of, of what the main uh, groups groupings of the expenses are. Uh, so you have some idea of, of it, whether it was a net profit or net loss, things that you could still do depending on the nature of the business, how it's taxed. In other words, if you were a sole proprietor, you might still be able to contribute to a retirement plan if we had net gain there, or maybe a, um, a SEP IRA or something like that, perhaps, uh, still at this point. Um, so I, I would look for things like that. Make sure you have good organization of your expenses and income uh, so that someone can look at it right away, know if you have profit loss, and then look at whether maybe you might be able to contribute to some plans or something like that. If you started a business too, I'd, I'd say just get familiar with ordinary necessary business expenses. Meals last year, 100% deductible, all your uh, equipment, like your computers and uh, th things like a cell phone for business use, you could write off. If it's, a, if it's a sole proprietorship, you have to divide it up between its business use and personal use. It's a lot easier when you're an S Corp. You can always write off your startup expenses if you set up an organization like an LLC or a, an S Corp or a C Corp, you want to grab those, your organizational expenses and all your startup expenses that you incurred setting up the business. You're going to want to grab those things. And you're going to want to look for anything that helps you create a profit. So there's so many things like your automobile, you could probably be reimbursing yourself mileage, uh, depending on the type of business, things like uh, your health, your health coverage could be covered. Uh, or deductible, your medical, your dental. Again, it depends on the type of organization uh, as as to whether they're deductible or not. Uh, but the, all those things, you want to make them front of mind and start saying, "What did I? What am I spending that helps my business?" Personally, I think everybody that's starting up a business should really be considering uh, an S corp because you get an accountable plan. I can avoid a whole bunch of the self-employment tax. I avoid having to do this weird home office, uh, filing that you do with a schedule C on a 1040. You get away from that. I can just start reimbursing expenses. I don't have to report. I can write off a hundred percent of my cell phone and my, in my data, in my, in my, in, in the actual equipment. I don't have to sit here and play what what percentage of it did I use for personal versus business? It's just so much better. And the audit rate drops about 800 to 1600%. And you actually win your audits as opposed to sole proprietors lose about 94 to 95% of their audits. It's in publication 55, table 17B. The last year they published that data, I think it was 2021. And you can go look at it if you, if you don't agree. <laughs> like You're like, no way. Yeah, actually go look at the audit rate and the success rate, the change rate on it. It's ridiculous if you're a sole proprietor. It's really, really, really bad. So I tend to look at those things whenever you're starting up a business. And then keep in mind, 
the type of business and whether you're going to sell it. So if you're doing a business that you anticipate having a lot of value in the next five or six years, the way you set it up could dictate whether you have tax when you exit. So there's something called a 1202 small business stock where I, I, I could make 10 million bucks, zero tax. I could make $20 million, zero tax. It just depends on how you set it up and what your exit is. I can't do that with an S corp and I can't do that with an LLC. So you start looking at these things and it lays it out and say, what is your intention with the business? And am I getting the maximum amount of deductions that I, that I want out of that? And then lastly, look at it from a business standpoint. If you're going to be using leverage at all in that business, it's a different animal. Now I might not want to take all the deductions that I'm entitled to, or I may want to spread them out over a longer period of time because I may need to show income if I'm trying to get banks, you know, lines of credits and things like that, or if I need credit cards, if I need to build the, the credit of that business, it's a different animal entirely when I need to show earnings versus if it's privately held and I don't care. You know, I'm not looking for loans and things like that. I don't, I don't care. I just want to pay the least amount in tax. That's, that's a completely different animal. All right. I think this is our last one. If an investor purchases a property that is lower in value than the property sold in the 1031 exchange, will the IRS disqualify the exchange entirely? No. What's going to happen is you just may not have full deferment of the capital gains, but they're not going to disqualify it on that uh, premise. Um, some things, you know, sometimes people put extra cash into a boot that helps change how much tax might have to be uh, paid, but you're just really just putting more into the deal, more cash as, as opposed to paying tax on it. But it won't, it's, it will not uh, disqualify the exchange. Yep. It, the, the additional amounts, so like if you had the lesser, like, so if you, if you buy a property that's less, you're going to end up with cash and they're going to call it boot. That's a technical term, but it sounds cool. Hey, Elliot, you end up with some boot, <laughs> you know, so. Not going to touch that one. <laughs> right. So you end up with some income that you're going to have to pay tax on. And so that's going to be disqualified from the exchange. And I can't remember, I think they allocate it between recapture and gain. They're just going to lower the amount. I can't remember exactly, but it's taxable. That's what you got to know. It's not going to be part of the exchange. I think yeah. you get a little bit of, I think they're using it proportionality to your basis, to your recapture and to the gain. Is that, am I, am I saying that right? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know, you, yes, uh, but it's not going to disqualify it. Yep. You're correct. It does not disqualify. You just have a little bit of boot. If you mess around and get like, Hey, I, I, I refied, I, I like I financed the purchase property and end up with cash. It's called cash boot, right? It's it. Hey, I, I, I bought a property the same value, but I, I did financing wait until you close to do the financing, right? Otherwise you're going to have a taxable event. Um, so you just always got to be looking at those things. Yeah, but don't do the refinancing right before or right after. Give it a little time either way. Before yeah. You that. yeah, and here's the here's the easy advice. Work with a qualified intermediary. That's what they're there for. And that's, you can't take possession of the money. You're going to have to have one anyway. So get a QI, a good QI and ask them, hey, what can I do? And make sure that you're following their guidance. All right. All right, just as a reminder, uh, if you got questions, please, you can email us at taxtuesday at andersonadvisors.com or visit us at andersonadvisors.com and put your uh, questions in that way. And we'll have more, another round of questions in two weeks for you. And um, I think that's pretty much all we have. Well, let me say this. So you can stop sharing uh, or no, actually keep that up there for a second, because I'll say you can send in your questions. There's about 58 open questions right now that we've answered over 220 written questions, plus everything that was in the chat. So if you have a question pending, you could stay on and wait for an answer. Otherwise, what I would do is I would submit it via the tax Tuesday at Anderson Advisors, or if you're a client, go into the Platinum Portal and post it. If you're willing to wait around a little bit, these guys will keep knocking these things out. But I think we should end the 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 uh, video in, the, uh, in, in that portion of the webinar. And then we'll get to knocking out questions. And so I'll stay on and answer questions. Elliot, if you could help these guys out a little bit too, yep. we'll make sure. And I do want to say thank you to Dutch and to, uh, to Jared and Troy and Dana 
these guys are all tax professionals that are answering questions, Tanya and Matthew and B Patty and even Ander out there. They're answering questions throughout this. And, uh, you know, we're doing it as a courtesy. So they're doing the very best they can to get answers today. I think we got crushed. Uh, we just had a lot of people on uh, today. We had uh, quite a few. So we'll get your, your questions answered. Uh, you just stick with us. If you're willing to wait a little bit, we'll get to yours. If you put in a Q&A and stop putting in more Q&As, we're going to get this, but we want to be out of here before midnight. So uh, so we'll get that. So Elliot, thanks for uh, thanks for being on, brother. I really appreciate yeah. you coming in and reading all the questions and, and being there in the studio while I gallivant around the country. Uh, it's always a pleasure having you on and, uh, and you do answer your questions. Well, thanks to everybody who asks questions and, uh, who was in the, in the, uh, I think there's more questions coming in on the chat. Even I stopped yeah. it, right. Let's get that in the Q and a, and we'll, we'll make sure that we get you answers no matter what, even if you get off the event, we'll, we'll look you up and we'll find out, you know, who answered it, who had a question that you get, didn't get a response to. We'll make sure we get you something. Uh, so until next time, we got two weeks until we do another Tax Tuesday. Ask your questions via Tax Tuesday. Elliot has been running in and grabbing the questions. So uh, he's been doing that. Thank you, Elliot, for doing that. That's that's always been something I've done for years, and I like not having to do it. And, uh, and join us for the Tax and AP event. I think it's February 11th, so it'll, it'll be before the next Tax Tuesday. So hopefully uh, you continue to increase your knowledge and you can be a lethal tax planner. Uh, and, and, and save some of that hard-earned money that, you know, that we all work so hard to, to create investments and to get returns. And I think you need to keep a little bit more of it. And uh, taxes is the, one of the ways to make sure that that happens. So, uh, Elliot, unless there's anything else. Well, thanks for joining us and uh, see you in two weeks. See you guys.